Should we start? Uh, yes, sir. Please start, sir. We are live now. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to all the MOOC students and participants. Welcome to the second live session of uh, MOOC courses in bioengineering and interactomics. We are going to talk to you today uh, live from our lab. Few applications which are based on mass spectrometry based proteomics. What we thought, you know, mass spectrometers have made a huge impact in various type of application. You think about cancer, you think about infectious diseases. Everywhere you will see that, you know, in which way uh, these recent technologies have made a huge impact and they have started uh, identifying some novel targets, understanding disease mechanism, and in, in many cases, even uh, potential biomarkers. So what we thought today, uh, given that mass spectrometers are uh, very large topics, and in the course, you're already studying about the uh, nut and bolts of the uh, different technologies, especially the proteomics and mass spectrometry. We thought to give you the flavor of these technologies directly from the lab by taking one case study on COVID-19. Of course, COVID-19 uh, does not uh, require any more introduction. Uh, and we have learned a lot from, uh, you know, during the pandemic. But what was also interesting uh, in which way our uh, powerful omics technologies, can they deliver uh, at the time when it was required? And that's where we thought, can we use various type of mass spectrometry technology to address different type of questions in the, uh, during the pandemic for COVID-19? One thing was, can we take uh, the complex uh, samples like you know, plasma sample from the, uh, the human, uh, which is infected with SARS-CoV-2, and look at their host responses in which way uh, due to the viral infection what kind of host immune response and host proteins get triggered likewise they were also curious to see like you know the nasopharyngeal swab sample which is uh, taken for the real time pcr uh, diagnosis part can we take the same sample and look at are we able to detect the viral peptides and can we also look at what are the uh, human respiratory specimen can reveal any host response of human as well so again, looking at deep host proteome profile uh, from the plasma or swab sample could provide us some novel insight. And likewise, from the swab sample, nasopharyngeal or autopharyngeal swab, can we get the viral diagnosis done? In which way one could understand the viral host uh, uh, interaction, also looking at various technology like immunoprecipitation, mass spectrometry. And then uh, can we also study the uh, immune response using protein microarrays another type of interactomic technology. So uh, as you can understand that different type of questions could be addressed from the same type of biological specimens by using these technologies. So uh, before I come to the actual technology and the, uh, you know, some of the demonstrations on the lab, let me just remind you that, you know, at the time when we were trying to understand COVID-19, first our team collaborated with many hospitals around in Mumbai and looked at the uh, epidemiology of the Mumbai population. And by now, these things are not any more surprising facts, but you know, uh, at the time we were looking at the, the, the big data sets to try to understand which age groups are getting most infected, which uh, type of comorbidities are actually uh, uh, affecting the individuals the most, where we can see more of the severe infection. And again, some of these uh, type of uh, epidemiological analysis helped us to understand that which are the patient group, which should be taken more seriously for the further investigation and looking at more molecular mechanism and the proteomics investigations. So this work was uh, at that time uh, very relevant, was published in one of the Lancet Journal in Clinical Medicine. We then focused on looking at the uh, patient's nasopharyngeal swab sample. And uh, uh, before I, I move forward on this part, let me first, uh, Acknowledge different clinicians, Dr. Jayanti Shastri, uh, Dr. Sachi uh, from the Kasturba Hospital uh, and KM Hospital, and Dr. Om Shwasto from Jaslok Hospital. All these clinicians were very helpful to provide us the uh, sample after all the uh, due diligence of regulatory approvals uh, to start this type of research. And uh, we were very curious, we had not done any type of nasopharyngeal swap proteomics prior to the pandemic. So we had a lot of apprehension that what kind of interference which we may see from uh, these kind of samples, because when you are looking at 
uh, the uh, swap sample, which is uh, with the VTM, what kind of uh, interference you will have, how to inactivate the virus and also still able to get the viral uh, proteins and peptides. All of these are quite challenging questions at time. Uh, so I, I don't want to make today very uh, uh, elaborate another lecture, uh, but rather just to, to set the context, I'll go through some of the slides rather quickly to give you a, a glimpse of what work we have done. But then what we want to spend more time is essentially directly uh, show you these instruments from the lab and take each application one by one with uh, uh, you know, uh, TAs of this course uh, who have been interacting with you, who will directly give you more insight about different technologies uh, in different application context. So uh, as you're aware that you know, mass spectrometry uh, based proteomics has really become powerful with uh, you know, more and more approaches coming with the shotgun proteomics. Now we do not rely too much about separating proteins on the gel, but rather we are directly taking the, preparing the lysates which could be digested and those digested uh, peptides could be uh, after cleanup could be subsequently analyzed for the MS and MS, MS analysis followed by data analysis. Now data analysis becomes very crucial because uh, in, in this kind of work, when you are looking at large number of peptides, uh, what type of database you're going to use becomes very important. Just imagine in the case what we are talking uh, today is about uh, nasopharyngeal swab sample from the patients. Think about we are taking from the human respiratory specimen. It means there will be human protein there. And if there is viral infection, then we will have those. Uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 peptides we may have as well. And uh, further, if we have uh, you know any co-infection, any type of other bacterial or fungal. Uh, infection, even they might reflect in these peptides. So now what we got is a cocktail of peptides from different organisms, from the human, from the virus, and maybe potentially from other organisms. So database search and bioinformatics become very critical as you can understand. So uh, one of the technology which is quite one of the workhorses is the Orbitrap uh, Fusion, uh, which we used uh, very actively for separating the complex proteome and then further, we used uh, different type of quantitative approaches, which includes both label-free and label-based technologies. Uh, Orbitrap can do uh, with the tribrid uh, technology with the quadrupole Orbitrap and ion trap provides you more flexibility of uh, analyzing the different uh, uh, ways of peptide analysis and gives better quantitative ability. Uh, we primarily focus on label-free quantification. So every sample was run individually and what we wanted to compare that what happens to in each sample on a given retention time, what is the spectral count difference in the peptides which, uh, and their relative intensity? Can we use that information for understanding the difference between the mild patient and severe patient with every single protein and every single peptide? So that's the kind of power of these technologies that you can dissect out all the entire proteome and then try to look at systematically for each protein, what kind of uh, fold changes you have. Alternatively, one could also do the uh, label-based strategy. Uh, some of you who may be a little new to proteomics, there are very different ways of doing the quantitative proteomics. This means you want to compare your healthy individual or disease individual control and treatment. You can do either label-based approach. It means you're introducing some labels which can be used to do a readout eventually, or you can use the label-free approach, which is as just I des described here. So in label-based approach, the peptides are labeled with the uh, isobaric tags, like tandem mass tag or uh, eye track, which is uh, uh, another way of looking at the labeling. Uh, so again, both of these eye track and TMT could be working on the isobaric labeling only. Uh, and I'm not, not going to go in detail of principles of these, but idea is that they should not add an extra mass on your given sample. So three are mild patient, three are severe patient, then you would like to make sure that they're all isobaric. There is no separate mass added, which makes it different. And then they are going to be co-eluted, analyzed further at the MSMS level to show you what kind of fragmentation we have for reporter ions. And that could be used for the further quantitative analysis. DIA or data independent acquisition is a different approach. Both of these are DDA-based methods, while data independent acquisition looks for acquiring the spectra with much more higher resolution with the small windows of M by Z, and then try to use that information for further uh, you know, giving you high resolution data, which could be utilized with the spectral library comparison. So again, some of these could be 
easy for you to follow if you have already uh, take this lecture by now. Some of you who will be taking this in some time uh, in your course, you will be introduced in much more detail. But we just want to apprise you that, you know, when we say proteomics, we had many possibilities to explore, to think about how we can do the, this analysis. However, the major question was, can we do the good protein extraction? Because we had no uh, immediate, uh, that time, uh, the vital safety was a major concern. Uh, we did not have the prior experience of handling the swab sample and, and doing inactivation of virus. So working with these kind of uh, SOPs was very critical. And then of course, once the protein extractions are done, then one could move on to the looking at mass spectrometers to resolve them better. Uh, the broad workflow, which I think I have shown you earlier uh, as well, that you know we are looking at the leftover VTM sample from the patients, extracting with different type of organic solvent, which will inactivate virus and also extract the protein, digest them, and then either an orbitrary fusion to look at the global peptides or look at the targeted skyline-based approach, triple quadruple mass spec to look at selected uh, reaction monitoring for specific peptides. So I'm just showing you this workflow here uh, or the sample prep. Uh, of course, uh, you know, it'll be really uh, difficult to show you all these steps in the very short time. Uh, but just to, to uh, again remind you that sample preparation is the most critical part for any type of uh, high throughput omics based work, whether you, you talk about genomics, transcriptomics, or proteomics. In this case, we had to really first come up with, can we take these VTM samples and first inact inactivate them by doing the heat incubation and uh, making sure that virus is inactivated because uh, you cannot allow these kind of samples to, to come in the lab uh, and run in the instruments without ensuring the safety of this. And again, then there's a way of that, you know, how much uh, you want uh, these type of sample to be, uh, you know, heat treated. So you have to optimize that. But by that time, we had some WHO guideline and some of the recommendations from other labs, which also helped us to optimize these protocol. Uh, but then it was very safe to work with this uh, type of samples with 65 degrees incubation for half an hour or 45 minutes. Uh, then we looked at in the, uh, after extracting the protein, running them on the gel, that they look good. Then we injected in the mass spectrometer after peptide digestion. And we could find that uh, variety of extraction methods from isopropanol, ethanol, or acetone, they are all actually able to give us some unique peptides of uh, SARS-CoV-2, but the pool can give us the maximum peptide, which represents variety of protein from a spike protein to nuclear protein, uh, replicase polyprotein. So then we thought, can we take the cocktail of these picture and use that for further investigation? Again, as I mentioned to you, you can look at variety of proteome comparison from the uh, this type of sample. And we thought, can we look at the first host response? What is the human protein changes happening because of the viral infection? So any type of uh, comparison when you do, you need to make sure that your instruments are reproducible, your data quality is reproducible, and that's where we run same complex samples over the time so that we can see that they are actually reproducible. Like every sample, uh, when you're running three or four patient sample, after that you run one QC pool sample, which, should be done throughout uh, that several weeks or month time while analyzing the data so that you have a reference to compare that your instrument quality and uh, setup was reproducible, which looked pretty good in this case. After comparing the host responses, we could see there are uh, this uh, clusters are forming, which is the red one is a positive group and the blue one is a negative group, which was expected that you will have two separate uh, groups of the negative COVID, uh, negative and positive patients. While the uh, violet one, which, which was a bit of surprise, these are the recovered patient. So in some way, these are negative uh, COVID-19 patient, but they also uh, were mapped pretty much like the positive. And while looking at the patient history and talking to clinician, it turned out to be that they had just recovered patient. So it means they were still probably carrying the trace of viral uh, infection, uh, which was not acted with the RT-PCR, but probably could still be seen at the peptide level from the mass spectrometers. So that showed you that why mass spectrometers can be more sensitive. And looking at the data, one could actually then segregate the patients which are from the mild group of or the non-severe group versus the severe complicated group of the patients. So several proteins turned out to be pretty uh, uh, different in the two groups. But what we also first looked at, can you look at the clinically relevant proteins like lactate dehydrogenase protein, uh, various hemoglobin protein, stat protein, some of these were already being used in the clinical setting. Uh, but of course, then we thought, can we look at much more meaningful biological sample, which uh, is collected longitudinally over the different uh, time period 
uh, which is a plasma sample for the patient, because if you want to monitor the biochemical uh, parameters, various type of, uh, uh, to understand that, you know, how the patient is uh, uh, responding to the drug or how patient is getting deteriorated, various type of clinical tests being done on the plasma. So left over plasma sample could be very powerful to have the patients continuously uh, being monitored. You know? But when you don't want to take the swap sample after three days, five days, seven days, 10 days, 14 days, rather the plasma sample already being collected. So that could be used for looking at host response better. So we took the plasma sample and we did depletion of the abundant proteins like immunoglobulins and uh, albumin so that those can be removed. At least partially they can be depleted as you can see in the gel as compared to undepleted here. And then we uh, proceeded with the mass spectrometry workflow and the top middle panel shows you what I already spoke about the swab samples. So both of them in different ways are showing us the host response. Uh, we had quite a bit of expertise of looking at plasma proteomics and at the same time, when we were working on this project in, in 2020, we had just published this paper in Nature Communications Biology, which was talking about different type of severity of malaria, looking at cerebral malaria and severe anemia uh, as compared to the mild or the non-severe falciparum malaria. So since we had expertise of doing this work and already we had the regions available, we thought we can expand the study on 200 or so patients to look into the how we can look at plasma proteome analysis. Again, as, as the visuals from the sample prep can, you can uh, understand, uh, more than doing the science, the safety of people, the PPE and all the protection and biosafety labs, all those are very much critical uh, to, to perform these projects. And then of course, uh, bringing a sample with the safety transports and all the biosafety level of cleanup, all of those were very much challenging. Uh, but the technical side, when you have these plasma sample, you can pass them from a column which can uh, deplete out some of these uh, abundant proteins. And then after a depletion of these protein, then you can uh, uh, do the digestion of these proteins and then those peptides could be taken forward for further analysis. So uh, again, I, I'm not going in great detail of the entire protocol or the uh, exact workflow, but giving you the flavor so that shortly you will be ready to have the live uh, lab demonstrations. This is a nutshell of this work of look comparing the negative and the positive group. Within positive, we have mild and the severe group. And after comparison of these groups, we could see like, you know, many proteins which turned out to be very interesting, like angiotensinogen protein, alpha-2 microglobulin, S100A8 protein, apolipobo protein. These were all very uh, much different in non-severe and severe group of patients. They also gave us some idea that what is happening mechanistically inside the uh, patient's body. And uh, this was the swab data which helps us to uh, understand that neutrophil degeneration pathway and some of the translation machinery are majorly perturbed uh, in these patients. And some of the literature review also we are, we are pretty much confirming that what we are finding in the right direction. And uh, similarly, we looked at the patient plasma sample and the host response and turned out to be complement activation pathway and leukocyte activation pathways were major uh, pathways which are getting changed. Uh, we also then uh, did a pilot study on around 25 patients to look at the longitudinal profile. And that was very challenging because you have to find the same patients and their two time point sample from the mild and severe group, which we did the longitudinal study. And that also, uh, you know, pretty much confirmed that, you know, leukocyte activation, alteration pathways and vitamin D binding proteins are uh, majorly seen changing in these two different time points. And this particular work was published in JPR, which was also uh, uh, in the cover page of the journal. So uh, uh, again, as, as I said, you know, I don't want to make it another lecture today. Uh, you have been watching our lectures every week. Today, now we want to spend more time with you on the lab-based uh, demonstrations and giving you some time on the instruments and uh, experiments. So uh, uh, the next uh, three uh, major applications we are going to, to, to directly take from the lab uh, with the help of uh, TAs of the course uh, who are going to introduce you once more and then going to talk to you about these applications. So let me uh, first uh, request to start the uh, quantitative deep proteomic analysis. It means you are looking at all the protein from a uh, given sample and their protein identification. Uh, it could be a simple, uh, you know, band from that you want to identify protein or a complex mixture of the protein and you want to look at all the protein identification. All of these things are possible with the different type of LCM SMS based approaches. All right, so are we ready for the live session from the lab? Argue and Abhilash? Yes, sir. Yes.
Uh, you are muted. Please uh, unmute. Argue you're not, not audible. Argue, please unmute yourself and then start speaking. We can't hear you. So this is the sample department where the samples are injected, so you can find here. The peptide samples which we will be going to explain in the slide the sample injection process. After the peptide injection, the peptides are brought here. After the peptide injection, the samples are brought here, the samples are put here. You go to the nano due to fragmentation, it has two kinds of forms. So once the sample has been injected, so this is what you are seeing is the mass failure, orbital based mass failure. This is the three column, this is the analytical column. From the three column, uh, the sample passes through the analytical column and it is subjected to the fractionator. So this is the probe from which uh, the fractionation happens. And if you can come a little bit close, then you can see the ICC also. So, from where the high voltage are maintained. So you can see that uh, silver one is the IPC. From here the high voltages are maintained and uh, we do monitor it uh, with the help of uh, the camera, like to build the public issues or the various issues are coming on that. And finally we acquire that kind of chromatograph. So Abhilas will be explaining you about the chromatograph. Okay, so once we inject the samples, now we, we want to look how many proteins we are we can cover. And for that, it depends how much, I mean, or, or, or what is the length of the column we are using. So this kind of experiment, the quantitative proteomics of the swab and plasma sample as discussed by Sir. So we first prepare the peptides and then we run using the orbiter fusion. And once the run is done, now we are trying to look at the chromatogram to to interpret how many proteins we can get. So we, pro we will process the chromatogram using a software called um, a Proteome Discoverer or MaxQuant, where we will get the number of proteins and the amount of proteins, right? So how that proteins, the software predict that that is important. So, but before going that, we will generally see how, how the chromatogram looks and what is the fragmentation of each the chromat chromatogram. So suppose this is this is one of the fragments, one peptide. Then how many fragments did this peptide come? So for each MS, we will check the MS fragments. And on the basis of this MS MS fragments, we will so these all are single unique MS MS. And on the basis of this, we will identify as well as quantify the peptides and then using different tools. From the peptide will convert it into proteins, and then the abundance can be calculated using different statistical tools. Okay, so each and every peptide will um, generally uh, predict and I mean generally quantify, and after quantification we do the basic analysis. So you can see our sample is running now. This is how we expect a chromatogram to come. So this is a two-hour gradient. We generally run for swab and plasma samples. That is getting run now. So it is, it is, it is, it ran till I think around 50, 52 minutes. So it will run till 120. But the most important while running a sample is looking at the methods. So whenever we, we run samples, we first optimize the method. So we'll just give a demo how the method looks. So since we are doing LCMS, so while, while running samples, we look at both LC parameters and the MS parameter. In LC, how much volume of the sample we are picking? What is the gradient? The gradient is a must, must, I mean, much needed thing. And on the basis of gradient, we expect the samples to be eluted, right? And then we just do a brief equilibration of column and three columns. And after that, we go to the mass spectrometer. So in mass spectrometry, we, we try to um, kind of identify and resolve each and every precursor as well as the product ions. 
where we give a setting of kind of you know in the orbit trap the resolution we set around 60000 with a span range of 375 to 1700 and then different different parameters we optimize similarly the the double the, the fragmentation also when it to set where well, we can show the this dvms2 okay and various parameters like the hcd that is the collision energy how much energy or gases we are supplying to fragment or to break the precursor ions those things are important so we place different parameters to optimize the methods and whichever method suits uh, best then we uh, finalize it so, so likewise we have optimized the method for this and accordingly this is this is one of the samples that are that is running now so basically after running this we will go to our different softwares to interpret the data thank you Vilash. Right? and so argue the deep, deep proteomics and the similar Avilash. similar thing we can do if we have a pure protein or some unknown protein so suppose we we, we run, if we run a sample uh, using a gel yeah, can I just interrupt you for uh, for uh, Avilash? Yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry. Uh, you know, uh, because of several applications, we have to show. We have to uh, uh, interrupt this particular part. So, idea is that irrespective of what sample you have taken, if you have a small gel piece. Which is a more simpler sample, uh, whereas if you have the directly uh, prepared sample, which is the complex lysate, you have much complex sample. Uh, but those samples you can directly uh, take from the LC MSML based configuration. From the LC, you want to elute out the peptides. If you have the simple band or spot, you can uh, run a short, a short 30 minute gradient. If you have the complex sample, you can run maybe two hours or three hours long, and then you can get the coverage. So this was the deep proteome analysis using one of the most uh, advanced and high resolution mass spectrometer uh, orbital fusion. Let me now uh, request Surabhi from our team to talk to you about another application. If you were to do immunoprecipitation to look at interaction analysis, and that was also very important to really know that uh, in, the, in the beginning of the pandemic that this viral uh, protein interacts with which other protein and what is the viral protein and host protein interaction happens. So that is next application which will be talked by Surbhi. Hi. Uh, yeah. I hope my screen is visible. Yes, go ahead. So uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, this application of mass spectrometry based proteomics that is interactomics. Interactomics, as the name would suggest, look at the interactions of the proteins. So um, for talking about SARS-CoV-2 and uh, its interactome with the host uh, proteins, this is uh, the experimental workflow uh, for uh, experimental workflow to identify what all proteins, the, the viral proteins uh, are interacting with. Uh, now this is called affinity purification mass spectrometry. Uh, the, the workflow includes expressing viral proteins uh, along with an affinity tag in some cell line model and using the affinity tag uh, to pull down that protein and the interacting proteins uh, along with the viral proteins and uh, followed by identification of the inter uh, interactome, uh, interacting proteins using mass spectrometry and further pathway analysis. So um, similar uh, on this note, this work was done uh, by many groups during the pandemic. And uh, this is a SARS-CoV-2 viral host protein protein interaction network, which uh, using the similar experimental workflow was used to identify various cellular proteins uh, interacting with SARS-CoV-2 proteins and um, plasmids encoding all the viral genes with a, with, with a tag that uh, called the, uh, the three uh, flag epitope were expressed in this HEK HEK 293 cell line and uh, 
the interacting pure, uh, proteins were co-purified. Another, uh, another study by this group, Gordon et al., was done, and they also identified uh, various proteins interacting with the viral proteins. And just uh, as an example, uh, this protein, this viral protein, ORF90, which was identif uh, identified to be interacting with this host protein TOM70, uh, as you can see on the screen, um, this, this particular interaction was validated, validated in another study. So they proved that, um, they, they showed that the ORF90 significantly reduced this expression of a particular protein interferon. And uh, the, the expression of this host protein, TOM70, it largely rescued uh, the overexpression of this interferon. And this was through ORF90 mediated in inhibition. So they sort of also validated the, this interaction uh, that was identified in uh, interactomic study. Another variation of uh, interactomics uh, is um, co precipitation. And currently we are using this particular workflow in our lab to identify uh, autoantibody targets in COVID-19 patients. Autoantibodies are antibodies which are directed against the self that is the host proteins. So um, using, using a particular protein that has affinity for IgG, uh, that is the uh, IgG immunoglobulins, this particular protein, protein G, has affinity for IgG. So using, using a matrix uh, which is attached to this protein G, uh, we are using this to pull down IgGs from the patient samples. Um, and here you can, you can see a schematic representation of that. So the plasma has uh, all the immunoglobulins and antigens. So we are using this protein G to pull down IgGs. And with the IgGs, the host proteins will also, uh, will also be pulled down. And then we run it on gel and see the profile. For example, this one is how the profile uh, looked like. And after subjecting them to LCMSMS analysis, we can identify the proteins uh, that were interacting with the IgGs. So this way, co precipitation coupled with mass spectrometry can be used to investigate autoimmune response and identify auto-antibody uh, targets in serum samples. Thank you. All right. Um, okay, so uh, let's continue uh, with more of the applications. I, I hope uh, the students and participants who are watching this session uh, can see that you know these technologies can be useful for so many applications. Right? Uh, we are just talking about uh, you know one by one that how the same instruments can be used uh, for uh, deep proteome analysis or looking at uh, you know, various type of applications. And now we talked about immunoprecipitation. Let's now next talk about metabolomics. Let's just uh, change the flavor from proteomics because the same instruments could also be used for the metabolite analysis. And again, at the time of uh, pandemic, we thought we are taking the serum or plasma sample from the patient. Why not we try to look at which are the small molecules or metabolites are also getting changed in these patients' uh, sample. So uh, Shalini uh, uh, from my lab and uh, who's also a TA for the bioengineering course, uh, she actually did this particular uh, work along with other students from the lab to look at the metabolomics profiling of COVID-19 patient. Idea was to take the uh, mild and the severe group of patients, compare which are all metabolites are getting changed uh, in these two groups when we compare them. And can we identify a set of metabolites which could be uh, differentially regulated like what we have seen in the proteomics? So let me now uh, request Shalini to talk to you broadly about metabolomics and show some workflow in the executive mass spectrometer for this particular application. Uh, thank you, sir. So uh, I hope my screen is visible. So yes. hi all, uh, this is the basic workflow. So as sir has already explained that all the mass spectrometers can be used for different applications. So one of the applications is metabolomics because metabolites are uh, basic 
basic structure or basic regulators of all the pathways. So here, what we try to do is that we try to take the nasopharyngeal swab was collected in the VTM tubes. And also we had collected the whole blood samples, which were from which the plasma was isolated. But again, these samples are very crucial. And uh, then these samples have active viral, it can have active viral load. That's why the first step, the first crucial step is to inactivate the viruses. So we have multiple methods to, to, to inactivate the viruses. One of those which we use is by using the ethanol method. So the volume, two volume of the ethanol was taken for the serum sample and it was incubated for five minutes at room temperature. Then the ethanol was allowed to evaporate in the lab so that nothing is coming out can, uh, can affect the people working on the samples. And then after that, the when the virus was inactive, then after that, it was taken for extraction of the metabolites. These, this metabolite was extracted by using the methanol in four volume of the sample. And then it was kept for incubation for overnight at minus 20 degrees Celsius. Then the centrifugation was done so that the protein content is pellet down and the whatever remains in the supernatant is the metabolites. Then the metabolites were concentrated using the vacuum concentrator because when we are going through multiple steps here by adding ethanol and methanol, then we are diluting the samples. Already the metabolites in the serum sample or the plasma sample is low. So we need to concentrate the, uh, the, the metabolites what we have extracted so that the profile of these metabolites can be seen and evaluated properly. Then these are added to the glass vials uh, uh, along with the internal standard, which is we are using to monitor the instrument run every time what we are running because metabolites are highly dynamic. So we need to have internal standard to check whether the instrument is working properly or not, or the variations are whether, whether the variations are coming because of the instrument or because of the biological variation. Then the LCMS was done. So this part will be shown by Avinash and Nirjar shortly. So after that, after, after the run is complete, the raw files are taken up in the compound discoverer software, and then it is analyzed for each peak, and each peak is annotated by its MSMS pattern. And then once these things are obtained, the Excel sheet in the form of P cross N matrix is obtained, and then it is further analyzed for secondary analysis by using Metabo analyst, or further exosomes can also be studied. Uh, so exosome is a part where uh, we see for the exposures happening due to environment. So after an analysis, we were able to see that these are the different uh, pathways which were getting enriched by the significant metabolites obtained. So when, once we further studied these, we were able to see that uh, these are the major uh, components like creatinine was involved in the alteration of threonine catabolism aspartate and asparagine metabolism and glutamate and glutamine metabolism, whereas uh, propionyl carnitine was involved in fatty acid metabolism and the uh, oxycholic acid and glycine conjugate was involved in triglyceride metabolism. So uh, now I would like to request uh, Avinash and Nirjar to show the instrument and how we had used uh, MS for analyzing the uh, metabolomics part. Yeah. Uh... So, uh, hi everyone. So, just like any other mass spec, uh, we do have uh, the uh, LC. So, uh, this can be connected uh, both to a nano LC. A nano LC is generally used for proteomics. We have already seen in case of uh, fusion how it works and all. So, now at this moment, we are doing metabolomics with uh, the QEQ executive instrument. So, we have connected a UHP LC, uh, which is the thermos vanquished. So, it has a UHPLC column, uh, which looks like this. It has inside, inside this. And uh, also, uh, as according to any UHPLC, it has a much broader auto sampler uh, phrase where we can keep our samples. From the column, it goes inside the mass spec 
So as any other mass spec, it has a ion source, and uh, it results of this particular mass spec uh, Q exactive has uh, two mass analyzers, the quadruple as well as the orbit with itself. So after each sample is run, so during the run we can monitor each sample runs like this in the real time manner, and we can uh, line up samples like this. So after the runs are over, we can uh, qualitatively view it. Uh, the base peaks as well as we do keep some internal standards like in this case we have one internal standard that comes around this rt so we can check it also after obtaining this uh, raw files we can go and uh, analyze it in softwares like uh, compound discoverer similar to the proteome discovery in case of proteome and many other uh, similar kind of softwares and further tertiary analysis All right, and it's would you like to show a little bit whether pine or any kind of you know the QC standards on the so uh, this is the standard that I was talking about, the internal standard result pine. So it's a molecular weight m by z is around 609, as you can see here. And according to our gradient, it comes around uh, 9.57 uh, uh, RT. So uh, and if someone else also has some other internal standards, they can also pull up the ranges part and add if any other uh, standard they have to put the MYC value in this range and once then okay it will show the particular where that will that standard is coming out eluding out all right uh, thank you Nigel, for giving the demo and uh, thanks shalini for the overview uh, again to all the students as uh, we have not talked in great detail about metabolomics that was out of the scope of the course. Uh, but given that we are using the same instrument, as you can see, same LCMSM is being used for proteomics and for metabolomics. Uh, it's just a matter of using different columns and different solvent system. And you can obtain some very novel information about which are the metabolites, uh, which are also getting perturbed in the uh, host. One could try to obtain some novel information. However, uh, uh, you know, it is not as simple as just, you know, uh, having an instrument and you run a sample and you get the data. Uh, metabolomics, uh, while the extraction methods are very simple, just methanol extraction works the best. But uh, looking at, you know, a variety of uh, possibilities for metabolite, you have to choose the right type of column, a C18 column, helic column, various type of columns can be used. Likewise, uh, you will get large number of metabolites, which is uh, their M by Z values from the mass spectrometer but then identification becomes very challenging because most of the time you may not find the right type of, uh, you know, the correct matches for those. So you will have to rely on a lot of uh, data analysis, which can give you idea that how many metabolites can be identified. So again, identification with the database is still one of the challenge. Uh, just think about in case of uh, SARS-CoV-2, patients were given several medication. Now, if you take the plasma sample and you look at their metabolites, is that something because of the drug, what we see the metabolite changes, or is that because of the host response to these metabolites, what we see? So again, those kind of things become uh, critical to analyze and look into that context that what we are looking at is the directly metabolite changes, or are they something based on uh, directly the drug which has been given to the patient? So broadly, I hope you are convinced by now that these technologies have the potential to uh, uh, look at the complex uh, proteome and metabolome using these uh, mass spectrometers and give us the, uh, for very unknown samples, give us a lot of uh, information in a very short time. Data analysis and databases, of course, remains one of the most challenging aspect uh, for any type of complex data analysis. And that was the challenge in, in this time as well. We had to come up with the SARS-CoV-2 databases for the proteome search and look at all possibilities for the metabolite search. Uh, nevertheless, once you have identified a set of uh, proteins and metabolites, now you want to validate them. How can you do that? So now, if you were to look at the protein-based validation, uh, if I ask you a question, what kind of technology comes to your mind, uh, you will think something which is in light of uh, antibody-based work, right? Some sort of Western dot, ELISA, other type of uh, immunofluorescence-based assays. So various type of immunoassays, which are all linked to different antibodies, uh, are being used for protein-based test and protein validation. However, just think about in this case, how quickly we can get the antibodies against the 
SARS-CoV-2, it was not possible for very spike protein, nuclear protein, and, and other replicases. Can you get the pro antibody generated very fast? Many of the host proteins are changing. Can we get antibodies very quickly? Probably not. Only whatever is available uh, in the market, that's what can be used. Alternatively, can we use mass spectrometry as a way for uh, even validating our targets? So that's where we are now going to introduce you to the next type of mass spectrometer, which is a triple quadrupole mass spectrometer, and that is uh, being used for targeted proteomics workflow. Here I'm showing you two different types of mass spectrometers. Uh, one is the triple quadrupole mass spectrometer, and other is Orbitrap, which you just seen just now, the Orbitrap QE, which, which we uh, talked to you uh, for the metabolomics and the fusion, which we talked for the proteomics applications. So idea is that, you know, once you know which uh, proteins uh, are, are really differentially expressed in your non severe and severe group of patients or your control and treated group or the negative and positive group. You want to validate only those selected uh, peptides and proteins. You don't want to look at thousands of proteins at the same time now. So you are looking at very specific targeted assays. And that's where uh, an alternative to antibody approaches are SRM or selected reaction monitoring based, mass spectrometry based assays now. So uh, the same actually setup and same configuration and same concept could also be used for the targeted metabolomics assays. Although what I'm going to talk and show you is more in the context and the light of the data that we have from targeted proteomics, but even the same instrument and same work are also being used for targeted metabolomics. So again, think about these technologies can be employed irrespective of which type of projects you're going to work on and what is your uh, you know, validation which you want to do, do deliver. So the top panel shows you triple quadrupole mass spec where you have uh, two set of quadrupoles, Q1 and Q3, which are the four metallic rods uh, where the, uh, uh, these peptides which are ionized form are going to revolve. And further to select the most intense ions, you are going to have the collision cell, which is misnomer Q2 is being used. And so let's say one of the most intense orange uh, ion from the peptide of our interest is getting fragmented and that you are going to further monitor and you are looking at their ion intensity. And what we're generating is time versus ion intensity plot. And you're looking at these transitions from the, uh, you know, the parent ions to the, uh, uh, to the fragment, fragmented ions. And then you are looking at how best you can look at from the same peptides, multiple transitions to be generated and to be analyzed to look at their cumulative intensities, which could indirectly indicate you the protein quantification or protein intensity. So this is the, the broad concept and uh, it requires a lot of computational work, which requires first to select your peptides of interest, make sure that you know their length and their uniqueness, all that's being checked in the software on the skyline. And then you can proceed further to make the transition list, which could be given to the software. And then you can do your data acquisition in the mass spectrometer. Alternative thought is to do PRM or parallel reaction monitoring. Can we uh, come up with an approach where we can look at all the peptides rather than relying only on few selected peptides? Can we rely on all the peptides and look at their validation? So therefore, the PRM-based approach is being used uh, with the Orbitrap configuration, uh, where you have the quadrupole and Orbitrap. And quadrupole works as a mass filter, and then Orbitrap, given the high resolution and the uh, uh, you know high efficiency, it can take all of these ions and look for their further uh, fragmentation. So again, the similar configuration, like collagen cell is there, and you've got two mass analyzers, like Q1 and Orbitrap, which can be used for doing PRM. Similar kind of approach, which is like PRM, is known as SWATH, which is from other technology uh, uh, vendor, which is uh, from the SIREX, which is a SWATH technology, which is also with a triple top, you can do the similar application uh, like PRM, and uh, DIE kind of analysis can be done, data independent acquisition. So there are many approaches and, and which is actually gives you more possibilities to explore these workflows, right? So uh, when we look at the uh, this particular project for the uh, SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19, our uh, first goal is to always ensure that our data quality and instrument reproducibility is good. So we run some standard sample. And in this case, the uh, BSA, a few peptides are being monitored every day to ensure that we know we are looking at the good uh, intensity and we are looking at a good performance of the equipment, retention time is reproducible. Once we did that, then we moved on to some of the marker which we identified from the swap sample, which were also clinically relevant. So if you recall that, you know, the, uh, the first pandemic 2020, that time it was a very unknown uh, disease where uh, whatever new information we can get, it was pretty uh, unique. 
So uh, some paper reported that okay, uh, interleukin six can be indicative of difference in negative and positive and mild and severe, and, and doctors started testing that everywhere. Some people reported lactic dehydrogenase may also be a good indicator, or C-reactive protein for that matter, uh, or aspartate transferase for that matter. Again, all of these became uh, individual tests to assess that the quality of the uh, what is going on in these individuals. Uh, we thought, can we look at with the mass spectrometers with our direct assays, all of these markets, like, you know, what is happening to these, which are clinically relevant, can we first of all detect them? And very happily, though, we can hit all of them, right? Uh, but more importantly, using our mass spec-based uh, uh, mass uh, uh, targeted assays, you can look at even much more number of peptides. If you're not relying on one test with one ELISA kit or one biochemical assay, you can actually look at here maybe 30, 40 peptides and different proteins. So now we look at even multiple proteins, angiotensinogen, epolipo B protein, fibrogen gamma chain protein, serpentin proteins. All of these proteins, which we try to, to compare their non-severe and severe response. And that was pretty dramatic. Like we could see a huge difference along with the clinically relevant marker, which we can also test on the same sample. Now we can also look at what is happening for the newer protein, which we were nobody was able to test out with other assays. So that gives you the, the you know, good number of protein as a way to indirectly assess the patient's uh, uh, you know, possibility of moving from the mild to the severe form of disease. And that became very important because now you have a set of protein which may indicate how a patient is actually deteriorating and probably can be taken forward for the ICU or more kind of therapeutic interventions. Throughout of this process, you have to make sure that you are spiking in some heavy label synthetic peptide in every sample. And that should show you the same intensity and same retention time because that should not change whether you are running the mild sample or severe sample, right? So again, uh, we do want to uh, you know, keep giving you idea that while doing the experiments, you have to keep a lot of you know, controls and a lot of standards in mind. And based on this type uh, of assays, even we were able to look at viral peptides and look at set of 11 peptides from spike protein, nuclear protein, and applicas polyproteins in 10 minute solution, can we look at their profile to compare their uh, uh, you know, intensity values and also correlate them with the CT values. So uh, the last uh, demonstration is going to be now uh, on the targeted proteomics uh, with our team. And probably Avinash is going to take you through the targeted proteomics for cure. And uh, Medha is also there. Yes, Medha, go ahead. Hello, everyone. So uh, I'm Medha. I'll be talking about the instrument. I'll be showing you the instrument here. So here we are currently uh, have HPLC to our triple quarter core, KSQ alters. So this is where we place the samples. Uh, you can see we have placed the samples here. The wires are here. Uh, the injection happens from here. The sample will be taken up. As you can see on the screen, one sample is running right now. This is our standard QC sample. Uh, this is the triple quadrupole mass spectrometer on which we do the targeted assays. Uh, so right now we are running BST to check the daily instrument uh, output, how it is coming, how the response is coming. So you can see it is a five minute gradient. Uh, you can optimize the gradients and according to how Sir has said, depending on your samples, you can uh, vary the gradients, optimize the transition list and all that can be done. So I will show you one of the uh, runs that were done earlier. So for example, we run daily some complex samples and we uh, monitor the response that is coming. As you can see, uh, this is a standard cell lys lysate. Here for a, a few of the proteins we are monitoring and we can see how the uh, day-wise response is changing. So for three consecutive days, you can see here the response is more or less similar. This day was, uh, we have kept as reference, which was way before the uh, these three consecutive days. You can see the response, uh, response is same. Even similar for another standard sample, which is BSA, a purified protein. Here also you can see, we monitor certain proteins for which we have refined the method. And this is how the uh, peaks look like. They are all similar looking. 
and the response is almost equal. So this is the software with which uh, we operate the LC, the HPLC unit. Here you can see we can operate the pump, the sampler, and the oven. In the sampler, we uh, put the information of where the vial is kept. In the pump, uh, we get the information of how much pressure is there for a particular column and how much flow rate we have kept. And this is the column related uh, tab. Here we will put uh, details about what temperature the column should be at while the run is going on. So currently, since the run is going on, it will keep changing based on the method that we have optimized. Now the sample acquisition will start. Here you can see the sample will be injected. The sample is being injected here. So now the injection needle will move to the uh, vial. So it is moving to the vial and now it will take up the sample. After this, it will inject the sample into the column. And from the column, you can see the column is here and from the column the line goes to the mass spec and we will get the response here all right uh, thank you very much Mehta, for uh, doing this demo for target proteomics workflow uh, we are almost uh, at the end of the session now uh, so first of all, let me thank all the TAs for you know doing the perfect job uh, at the very uh, defined time which we wanted to show you demo. And as you can see, there's a lot of coordination required among so many people and on different instruments uh, to really meet everything within that uh, one hour time assigned for this live session. Uh, I hope uh, the participants are able to follow these things that you know beyond the theory which we talk in the course, uh, how uh, in the real life, how some of these problems which we would like to address uh, especially looking at the clinical proteomics and metabolomics could be addressed by using this technology. Then mass spectrometry has really become one of the very powerful resource and the workhorse uh, in the omics technologies. Before we close, let me announce you once more and remind you that uh, uh, for the bioengineering course, in addition to uh, all of our uh, uh, TAs who are following up your forum and interacting with you, we also have a live session uh, every Friday uh, with Lavanya, who is talking to you about the, some assignment. Uh, do interact and try to take some of this opportunity for further questions. We are also having uh, a bioinformatics live session for both the groups, uh, bioengineering and interactomics group, which Ankit is taking for uh, introducing you to some new tools of bioinformatics, just much beyond than just the course and the uh, topic which we're talking, to give you a better feel of how you can do some of the things at your home and in your uh, place yourself. So I hope you are enjoying both of these more courses, uh, Bioengineering and Interactomics. Uh, you had several questions, uh, which uh, you know we thought we'll talk, but you know, given the short time, let me just take one uh, you know, question, which I, I recall was essentially talking about role of mass spectrometry uh, and how one could actually think about a future carrier possibility in this area. So uh, just let me uh, mention once more that you know, once if you are currently getting trained in the technologies like mass spectrometry. And if you can do proteomics or metabolomics or these applications, you are going to be in great demand because of the way these technologies are so powerful and the way many applications can be done. There's a lot of focus from the pharma sector and various type of R&D labs uh, to really utilize the mass spectrometer for various type of applications. So your basic theoretical knowledge and your practical experience can really uh, bring you to a good market for the jobs as well along with learning what you're learning uh, in the current MOOC courses. So we'll be happy to interact with you more and give you more flavor of these technologies. And uh, at the end of courses, the students who are really topper of the course, we usually give them opportunity to, uh, to come to our lab and, and do some uh, short internship as well. So that again, if you're performing well, 
uh, you will have more opportunities to interact directly and work in our lab as well. Uh, that's pretty much for the today's live session. I hope you have enjoyed uh, learning some of the complex technologies. Uh, and we'll again once more interact with you the next month uh, with some new flavor of new technologies. With that time, it will be more about interaction analysis with the more recent approaches of microarrays and surface plasma resonance and biolayer interferometry technologies. Till then, uh, good luck and uh, keep studying and watching our MOOC lectures.